Thank you all for coming. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Professor Kilburn, because that's what my mother calls me, Professor Kilburn. And I teach politics and international studies here. I also run the Oral History Center, under whose auspices we have a narrative studies uh, symposium series. Under those auspices, I've invited a rich, Dr. Rich Blundell to give a talk on narrative ecologies in the Anthropocene. I'm sure you'll explain the key terms yep. as we go along. Uh, Dr. Blundell was formerly of Macquarie University in Australia. I don't know what you've been doing since, but you can fill it in. Um, and he was also one of our first presenters in the Narrative Studies Symposium series about five or six years ago. Four. Four years? Oh, yeah, four November 12th. I looked, I just, I, because I updated the PowerPoint, and so it's, okay. Great, so uh, I give to you the return of uh, Dr. Blundell. New and improved. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Richard, because that's what my mother calls me. <laughs> Richard! Um, usually because I was out in the woods, and it was getting dark, and it was dinner time, and so I was like, Richard! Um, Thank you all for coming. Um, it's 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 a it's a bit of a bigger group than I expected, uh, but that's good. That's great. I come here. I'm an ecologist essentially, uh, so much of what I do is, you know, nature based. So to talk to a group of people who are passionate or know about narrative is is exciting and challenging for me. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, I call it a conversation because. I, I imagine that you might know as much as I do, if not more, about narrative. Um, and it's been a while since I talked directly about narrative, so I might be a little rusty. So I thought we could, we could kind of do this more as a conversation. Uh, if I could just clarify, it's, it's the narrative studies series, but this is a class in environmental issues. So oh. they're well-versed in ecology and stuff. Okay, cool. So are there people here who uh, are into ecology but not into narrative? Or environmental studies and not narrative. Is there is anybody here who's like not familiar with narrative? And what, okay, well I'm hoping to get some input on it as well. But um, so what I'd like to do, I guess, is uh, do this in three parts. Um, the first part, we will talk about narrative, uh, and I'll ask for you to sort of educate me as well. Uh, the second part will be about the Anthropocene, what it means, and which is really, and then we'll switch to a question of why. Why are we living in the Anthropocene? Um, and then part three will be a kind of a response. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna respond to the Anthropocene? Specifically, the, the kind of question I'd like to keep in mind is this. If the Anthropocene is a planetary response to humans, what is a humane response to the Anthropocene? So like, what would be an appropriate response uh, for us now that we can identify this thing we call the Anthropocene? And we will get into what the Anthropocene is. Um, um, so, but before we do that, I, I kind of wanted to spend just at least a minute so that I kind of know who you are, you know, as, as sort of as a collective and individually. Who, who are you? I guess, so I guess this is a mixture of environmental studies, you said? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we just finished a section about um, biodiversity, ecosystem services, Just, just before we like dive in, how would you say you treat, uh, did you say, you said solutions. Did you talk about what the precursor to solutions are, like the problems? Yeah, yeah. And do you talk about the causes of the problems? And, and, and how, how far upstream do you go? We don't go too far. So we've got an hour and 15. Um, most of these students are not science students. Okay. I imagine this is their, their science. They have heard the term. <laughs> it's also pronounced, uh, it's, I, I pronounce it Anthropocene, but others pronounce it uh, Anthropocene. Anthropocene. Yeah. 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 And Nick Cave pronounces it Anthropocene. <laughs> and it's not really necessarily a thing yet, it's just that it's an idea that's out percolating out there. 
And it's a complex idea, but we'll get into that. Maybe you want me to say just a word about the sure. approach? So the narrative study symposium was started by myself from the Oral History Center and the English professor Stan Alexander. And we got together with the idea of using narrative or storytelling as a way of uh, working across the curriculum mm -hmm. so to see how storytelling uh, works in many different disciplines. And we had everyone in the series from artists and poets and writers to philosophers, mathematicians, physicists. I believe yours was on big history or cosmic history. Yeah, cosmic history. So uh, from a variety of perspectives, looking at how humans make sense of the world. Nice. Not only make sense of the world, but actually order the world uh, through storytelling. Nice. That's huge. Is that new? Like. Um, I fell into it five or six years ago through, uh, it's sometimes called narratology. Yeah. Um, and it's a very interdisciplinary approach looking at um, stories. And there's even a, a, a physical part of it that cognitive scientists um, have said that stories can actually structure the, the brain and the thinking process. So. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, so then it's by design, right? That this is happening. It's not just the, by chance that we have environmental issues, environmental studies, and narrative studies. That's clearly by design, right? I, I cold called him, but he was agreeable. What, what do you see the connection as? Uh, I didn't want to front load it, so I'm going to okay. have my own opinion, but I'll say Okay, that. well, but that opinion, I hope, comes out at some point, because that's the conversation I want to have. Um, so, of the students that are environmental studies, in the environmental, how many of you have heard of narrative or narratology or narrative studies? No. Okay, so it's new. Okay, good. So, well, then, then, then. Uh, all right, I'm in the right place. So, narrative. Uh, what is it? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Somebody who doesn't study narrative. Sure. I heard you say storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. Which is really the first sort of thing, narrative structure, which goes back to Aristotle and his poetics and deep philosophy, the content of a story and the form used to tell the story. That's not the narrative we're talking about, really. That's a great sort of introduction or a way to, 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 to engage with narrative studies because we can, because we can because we can kind of embrace what that means, that there's an arc to every story. <coughs> there's a chronology, and things happen in it, and plots emerge, and sometimes a meaning is made, right? Um, but we're gonna dive a lot deeper into it. Um, another sort of field that has emerged recently, kind of on the back of, back of narrative, narrative studies, I, I didn't study narrative, in, you know, I did, it, was a, it was a new thing for me. I only encountered it, you know, in 2014, uh, really, when I started doing my uh, graduate work. But uh, so narrative psychology, um, McAdams says, the field has advanced on the shoulders of story to such a degree that narrative approaches have moved to the center of the discipline. So what he's saying is that narrative structure and psychology are somehow married. There's something going on in this narrative structure thing and the way human psychology works, which is a, a kind of a signpost uh, at, the, at the continuity between narrative and psychology. Uh, here's another one, there's this idea of narrative consciousness. Uh, that, and so Damasio says, consciousness begins when brains acquire the power, the simple power, I must add, of telling a story. So he's kind of brought it even to the next level and saying, that consciousness, you know, the, the hard problem. If you're a philosopher, you know, you're introduced to the hard problem of consciousness. We can't explain it. Well, here's, here's an idea and a, and, and a structure that can kind of give us access to understanding consciousness. So it's pretty deep narrative, runs deep. So when you're thinking, there's narrative going on. I can't imagine thinking without narrative going on, frankly. And then there's this thing, narrative identity that I, I, this I came across, this in my research was, so this refers to the internalized, evolving, and in, in integrative story of the self, okay? So, like, this is getting personal now, that narrative can operate deep within us on a personal level. So, me, rich odd, me, my, rich, like, there's a narrative, rich, rich as a narrative, like, that's 
I don't know, there's something profound about that, I think. Something important, something exciting, something enlightening. So if you, just to encompass all of that, you know, in a more general sense, we've got narrative theory. So narrative is a fundamental human strategy for making sense, I think you use that phrase, of the world and our experiences within it. So this is cool because it ties narrative, story structure, to experience. And this will become, I think this is really important, this idea that our experiences are narratively structured. So in other words, and this is the way I've come to understand it, is that <coughs> narrative or story is how we humans have evolved to give durability to our experiences. So when, when I just met Todd, you know, that was something that happened a while ago, but I've got this, I've already got a story of the moment I met Todd, and I can, instead of having to rethink about all of the steps that went, I can just play that, I can flip that story. I met Todd, we had a conversation about ecology, he's working this stuff. So Todd, the, the meeting of Todd now actually is a story. It's a narrative structure in my psychology that I can call up, and it's durable. I can remember it tomorrow. I can remember it three weeks from now. That little experience now, I can carry with me into the world and give it durability. So, so, which is, this might not seem all that interesting, but when you put this in a cosmic or natural context, context of nature, which we're gonna do later, it suddenly begins to like, uh, get exciting. So are there any, any, any other like additions that anyone can think of to add to this? Or any questions about any of this? Yeah. Maybe just one more term of meta-narrative. Meta-narrative. That culturally, all the stories we tell fall under a, a similar rubric. And that can change over time, but that's especially true of like. Yeah. So the way we make sense of things tends to be culturally contextual. So does anyone know what meta means? Like when you put meta in, in front of narrative? It's like the narrative of narrative, right? Or yeah. the collective narrative. Or is that a, is that a good yeah. way to put it? Yeah. yeah. The, the paradigm under which we right. make our stories. Which can take on a whole sort of reality of its own. Like we can, we can get, we can get, we can live immersed in narrative, and then project a meta narrative, which then becomes the narrative that contains all those narratives. I don't know. It just gets. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one example of that would be comparing the Native American meta narratives about nature to European narratives that we consider nature. Resource, they consider it part of a living ecosystem. Right. So we're confronting this paradigm shift now that's challenging. So, so meta narrative really as paradigm. Right. So an, almost like an analogous to paradigm. Okay. okay. Cool. So um, yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. But but I get the sense, and I would imagine you know the other you know scholars and academics get the sense that narrative is important because it, um, think about politics, you know, narrative, the intersection of narrative and politics. It's, it's, it's pretty relevant today. Um, so let's just carry on then to part two, which is the Anthropocene. So this is a diagram. This is basically sold to me as sort of the best science using the best, most comprehensive data from the world's best planetary scientists, a kind of depiction of what the Anthropocene is. So the Anthropocene, you know, there's two words there, anthrop, anthropo, which is humanity, and then scene, which is like a time period, a geologic time period. And so what this diagram represents is our best science, from our best scientists, best data, They've taken all of the, or, or, or they've identified these ecological systems and sort of compartmentalized them, and they've developed metrics for measuring what's going on in these systems as a way of figuring out what's, what's the level of, um, of disturbance or distress on these different ecological systems. So for example, biogeochemical flows. The fact that it's in the red here means there's way too much phosphorus in our biogeochemical eco uh, ecosystems. It's way even more nitrogen, way too much nitrogen in these systems. The other big red one is the biospheric integrity and the genetic diversity or biodiversity loss. 
Some of these other ones are a little less sort of, you know, in the red. Things like land system change is, is getting up there. And so what they do is they just take enormous amounts of data and sort of reduce it down into these, these, these categories as a snapshot of the, of, of, of the planetary health, if you will. Um, and they use terms like, you know, uncertainty and boundaries uh, and that sort of thing. And they're just trying to, to give us a sense for how dire or not the situation is. Novel entities is a good one. It's about things that we really can't predict that emerge in, um, you know, in the chemistry of the upper atmosphere or in, in deep um, sea environments where we don't know how some of these things that we're introducing into the environment are going to interact and create new, new uh, materials that we, that we don't even know how to measure. But I have a lot of problems with this. Um, because, you know, that's really not a picture of the Anthropocene. This is a bit more, this is better, because it shows us over time, it breaks it down into, uh, you know, different effects that we are experiencing, and they all sort of have this classic exponential issue, you know, where there, where there are all these measures of, of, of environmental degradation or, or, or whatever it is, are accelerating fast. It's called the hockey stick. And these are a lot of environmental measures. So you know, we can measure nitrogen, we can measure these, uh, the pH of the oceans, we can measure temperature, that's a, so they're very quantitative. And then these are nice because they're a little less quantitative, you know, they're less discrete values, but they're starting to look at human dimensions of the problem. You see how these more represent things like, you know, tourism is a definitely a human thing. That's what humans do. <coughs> but I kind of have a lot of problems with these too because that doesn't really capture the Anthropocene. That is the Anthropocene. Like this, is what it, this is what it feels like. This, is what, like. this is the experience of the Anthropocene. That too is the experience of the Anthropocene. But, you know, this isn't an image of uh, of, of rainforest uh, deforestation, right? This is like probably some kind of political conflict and just urban sprawl and you know toxic waste kind of stuff. But these are these are deeply human and political issues in the Anthropocene, right? And so I guess the question is like why? We'll, we'll st I'm going to stop with the Anthropocene and, and, and now. Let's start thinking about like why, given that, given what we know about like how life has evolved on this planet and how everyone in this room is here because this planet has provided just the right sort of conditions for you and every one of your ancestors to survive and make the right decisions so that, so that we could all be here today. So in other words, Humanity has inherited this planet that is, has been a bounty. You know, it's been this thing that has just given at every moment. We have, a, we have a star that pumps out energy that we've been able to incorporate into everything we do. And we've, you know, we've survived ever since we first emerged on the planet, ever since humanity's been here, like we've made it. So with all that ugliness, which it is, like all that, I mean, think about the state of the world. Why? Why? Why is it so messed up? Well, you know, I, I know there's a lot of beauty in the world, but there's a lot of suffering and a lot of ugliness. And I'm not a utopianist, but I just think we could do better. But the point is, is it why? Is, why is it so messed up? Anybody? Capitalism. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Evolution. Evolution. Okay. Well, we've evolved, right? We've, we, we've evolved uh, into this very powerful species that's able to do whatever we please, but we don't have very good, perhaps, foresight. And, but the, the, you could argue that if this, this is part of you know, the world, a, a part of life, then we are uh, one, you know, we've evolved. And okay. It ain't going in a good 
place in a lot of ways, but, but perhaps that's, uh, that's where we've evolved in time. I just think we could all agree that it's not that great, and why can't we fix it? You know, like, it, it seems, I, I mean, a show of hands, is something wrong? Like, is, do, do we feel like there's something wrong? Something's out of place? You guys think it's okay? No. Anybody here think? Thinking is we've created a narrative where there is something wrong, and that's the trap that I keep falling into with this class. Is that it's very easy, right? You guys know I'm always saying doom and gloom. There's this problem with agriculture, and there's this problem with that. Um, and that that might be my personal view, but somebody else is like, look at all the great things we've done with agriculture. Yeah. You know, people in general are not stuck. Look at the great things we've done with textiles. Yep. In rags, we're in a very cold place, really. And we're in a nice building and it's warm. So I don't disagree with you that there are things we could do better. That's really the question I think that there, I should be asking. There are, uh, you know, it's a perception that things are better. So the question is can we do better? Do we think we can do better? Absolutely. You know, yeah, I think we would all agree that like we can do better. So, And that's kind of why aren't we? <laughs> you know, like. That becomes the, the next question. I just had a crazy thought. That, you know, maybe it's just the old women's studies class that said men are strong. I would. Right? I, like, I, yeah. Men are running most of the countries that are creating the problems. Men are running the businesses that are creating the problems. But that's been true since 3000 BC. Whereas the problems that we're looking at here really can't be traced prior to maybe 1500. Which is why it's. I mean. I would want to push push the narrative that it has it has an intrinsic link to capitalist development, which is a historically specific economic form. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, capitalism didn't invent brutality or violence, but it did invent a mode of production that leads to these kinds of massive expenditures of energy for the sake of tremendous production and happiness. Right. Right. But you you can't if you're if we're talking about environmental devastation that depends upon usages of fossil fuels that wouldn't have made sense outside of capitalism. I'm also not asking for us to make sense or to make a judgment on history as much as the present. Do you know, so whereas, yeah, those, that mechanism called capitalism has provided so much security and joy and all those good things that we can measure to, I'm actually just thinking about today. Like, where do we go from here? Did you have something you wanted to say? Greed or selfishness? Greed or selfishness, yeah. Yeah? Overpopulation of technology. Nice. And also, just to bring it back to the subject, narrative. Can we think about like the narratives that that are linked to these things? Like capitalism definitely has a narrative. You know, there's a narrative thing there about the rational actor and the, the invisible hand and all these sort of characters in that in that narrative. Um, and what's the other one? Unlimited growth is another sort of chapter of, or anecdote of, uh, of, of, of capitalism. The pop population needs a story because it's hard to imagine society, how population... You mean like a cohesive group of people? Or like, population like general? Story. So, so my story is there are twice as many people on the planet as when I graduated from high school. That's my narrative. So I graduated with 400 kids. So today I'd be graduating with 800. And so and that kind of narrative then fixes the story in people's minds. And my guess is not that it's important, but that you'll go away from here having that in your head. Right. The same way as you had the conversation about needing someone. So the durability of narrative gets sort of lodged. But it's a, and you can accept it at different levels. So a third grader can accept that at one level, and then a college student could, yeah. could see that in another level. I also like the idea that like a college student could 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 ad adopt the author role, so that they could actually change story. Whereas maybe a three year old would just accept it. You know, an adolescent would just sort of accept narratives. And I think that's the power of narrative. Yeah, is, is that you know it's like. Some of the old cartoons on TV that were made for the adults as well as the kids. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe part of the problem with our current narrative structure is uh, the format that it's very difficult to think long term. So we tend to measure things in terms of capitalism or quarterly profits or maybe a lifetime, maybe your children's lifetime, but to compare with other cultures who are thinking like the focus is the seventh generation down. Like yep. Hard to see the, the, the consequences in geologic time of the impact on us. So the two narratives working against each other. I hear what you're saying. I mean, I came to this through geology, uh, you know, initially. So that was like a whole three, a 4.6 billion year span of the history of the Earth, and ended up in big history or cosmic evolution, which is a 13.8 billion year story, which really shifts your, or, or it gives you. When you grapple with those numbers long enough, you, you never comprehend them you know, in a realistic way, but you do gain a capacity for saying, you know, wow, like, a, a, you know, you, you get comfortable with those kinds of things, saying, okay, so uh, there is an order, there are orders and orders and orders, categorical orders of magnitude more time <coughs> that we're not really able to comprehend. Okay. Yeah, so I, I did want to sort of focus, though, on, on, on narrative. And, and remember that list of narrative ideas about how narrative works on the level of psychology and consciousness and identity. And then there's also the, the broader uh, scale. And so, and so back, back to this, this, like, what are the narratives going on here? Like, can we see narratives embedded within this diagram? Yeah. Well, it seems to me that the, the diagram itself has a narrative going from the inside out. Yeah. That the, 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 the implicit story of any of these quantities as it passes that threshold is going from a, a state of security, uncertainty, and then freaked out because you, you're certain that things are bad. Right? But it's almost a psychological, like, it, like it, it seems seems implausible that we would move from the circumference inward. Right. We're going from the, the safe, secure. So there's a progression out. going on here, and it's incre not incremental, but there's a, there's, there's a, a progression mm -hmm. in, into high, worse things, worse values. B based on states of knowledge. Yeah. That, that depends on. Gotcha. And, and from the human perspective. Yes. Well, this is, you, yeah, this, this, one of, this is one of the reasons I have a big problem with it, but any, any other narratives that we can kind of pop out from that? Well, these are ecosystems, right? It's called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. I probably should have told you that first, but it's called, so boundaries. I mean, what is this, so, and what they mean by boundaries are, are, are these circular lines, these concentric lines, that each one of these is a boundary. They're not talking about boundaries between the different systems. But see, that's the problem. It's inherent in the diagram that these are, this system is, is somehow separate from this system. What is bi what do biochemical flows have to do with stratospheric ozone depletion? It's not, it's not inherent in this at all. It's, in fact, it's very reductionist and it's very scientifically minded. Even though they call themselves ecologists, they've somehow seen it as okay to separate out these systems. Each system is independent, like it's independent of the other systems. So it's like this, oh, we got it, we figured it out, it's simple, okay, so if we can just shift. So in other words, this is a problem of too much phosphorus. That's the problem. That's the problem, phosphorus is the problem, it's too much phosphorus, we can fix that. We have this like simplistic sort of assurance that we, if we just can fix the phosphorus problem, it's called the Anthropocene. Where's the Anthropos in this diagram? In the Anthrop the Anthropos is not seen in the Anthropocene by scientists. Because they don't have, they don't, they don't do this, they don't do politics and culture and, you know. So, so these scientists have relinquished that whole body of wisdom, right? 
I, I guess I just get really sort of riled up when I see this because it's like we can fix the problem if we just fix the phosphorus. If we just decrease it has nothing to do with like, well, where did that phosphorus come from in the first place? And what kind of mentality, what kind of narrative put all that phosphorus into the environment? They're not, de not de they don't have any mechanism to deal with that. And that's a problem. That the anthropos that the anthropos doesn't even isn't even represented in their in their in, in the best science from the best scientists. How are we going to solve this problem if we don't even see the Anthropos? And that's, that's like a metaphor. We don't see the Anthropos. But I think, and I, and I, do, this, uh, I do this exercise. when I, have, I teach a course in ecological intelligence. And, and I'll bring a group of people. Well, we could kind of do it here, actually. Um, so just, we'll just do this as a really quick thought experiment. So just take a minute to kind of look around, and this is a really bad example because there's not much nature going on here, but I can see slivers of it out there. Um, like, what do we see going on here? So normally I would take out a pad of paper and I would make a list. So I'd quantify the different things that we see. So who's, who, show me something, observe something and tell me what it is. Anything. I see a blue chair. So, blue chair. Anybody else? Anything? Plaid shirt. The shirt? Plaid shirt. Anything else? You feel heat. You're hot. Okay, it's heat. Anything else? Boring walls. Boring walls. Okay. Normally we do this outside. So, if you can imagine, like, there'd be birds around and, you know, trees, stuff like that. But anything else? People. People. Ah, that's good. So, you, so that almost never happens. That almost <coughs> never happens that we see us. Just like we don't see us in this diagram. Does that make sense? What kind of species doesn't see itself? Like what have we been through? What has history done to us? What, I mean, what kind of schizophrenia is that? That you don't even see yourself. Now, I've made a list here of all the things, and we could have done this all day, and I could have made a list of it. 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 things that could be, there could be on here. But then what I ask everybody to do is just to contemplate one thing, that, and that's this, that there's not 15 or 20 or 100 or a million things going on in this room. There's one thing going on in this room. And that's us being aware of us in the universe, as you know, on the planet. There's only one thing going on here, not a million things. That's a, that's a thing that, that's a, that is a, that is an awareness of unity. Like that, that's an awareness that can unify us. Which is, I think, a value. Anyway, but the, the question there is to get us thinking about, well, why don't we even see ourselves? And, 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 and what would be the consequence of that writ large on the world? Of a species that doesn't see itself. That's what it looks like. That's what the Anthropocene is. And if you're counting on science to, to wake us up and fix it, they're not, forget it. It's gonna take something else. It's gonna, and, and I've got ideas on what that something else is. Art, for one. Um, humanity, you know, the Anthropos part needs to kind of find a meta-narrative that's an appropriate and humane response to all to the Anthropocene. That was the. Let me make a counterpoint to that. I just I had an interesting conversation this week with an archaeologist in, in my field. We, we have to work with the, the various tribes, especially in the marine space. And he was explaining that you know, we look at a fish as a resource, it's something that we, we extract and we eat, whereas they, the Wampanoags, look at the fish as maybe even a, a relative. So they don't see themselves as different. So they're part of the continuum. So it's interesting that they don't see themselves, but in a different way. Whereas we don't see ourselves, I think, because we're extracting ourselves and like we're like above this situation. But what do they have that we don't have? I mean, in that scenario, what, what, what might they have you know, as a constituent part of their, of their psych psyche, their sort of consciousness that, we, that we've lost? You know what I mean? Like, well, you have more 
connected yeah. to their environment right. Right. and the, the things, you know, their narratives are not uh, as short as ours. You know, their narratives are going back 10,000 years and uh, often not written down, but oral narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, and their narrative is that we are part of this. Right. That's different. what they have. Is that, that, that sense of, the word I use is belonging. They have an inherent sense of belonging that they probably don't even really identify. It's just in part, it's part of them. And somehow we have lost that. And I'm saying, I'm making these proclamations as if they're true, and I'm, I'm already aware of like, you sh I shouldn't be doing that. But what I am saying is that we kind of have lost that sense of belonging. We've, 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 lo we've, we've, we've forgotten it. We're am amnesic about it. Um, and then the question then the, that comes, follows that is, well, what do we put there in place of that? If we've given out that belonging or, or forfeited it, what do we put in the hole that's left? You know, and it seems like we put stuff in that hole. Snapchat, Facebook. Or even yeah. just uh, BMWs and whatever right. else. So. Well, it seems to me that one thing that um, some indigen many indigenous peoples have that, that we lack is a distinction between person and human person. That, that we, uh, you know, the modern West presumes that only humans are persons, but um, many, um, you know, tribal cultures have the category of person, but it would apply to, say, the parrots, even sometimes the trees, they can be addressed, um, they, they, have, they have the status of personhood, yeah. But they aren't. They're not. They're not confused. They don't think that the tree is a, is a human. They right? think it's a being. They, but it's a person. It's right. a category. Yeah. It's, it's like a, we conflate those. As in, in the that only persons are humans. All right. But some cultures presume that person is a category separate from human. But that precisely that difference allows them to see human. Right. Where if if we live in a world in which we can only address and really see persons, right. Because we are the only persons around, we don't we don't recognize the, the humanness of our personhood. Yeah, right? I think. But if we can recognize the personhood of these yeah. other species, then we can recognize our own personhood as a human personhood. That's starting to sound like something like schizophrenia to me. Like there's something in there that is pathological. You know what I mean? There's something in there that's. Uh, disease, you know. I don't know. I mean, which, which part of it? Well, just that, um, no, no, not that there is that in the indigenous worldview, but that we have somehow lost that, or given it up, or distracted ourselves from it sufficiently so that it's no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. That is what sounds pathological. And, 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 and my, my, my PhD supervisor asked, well, where's your evidence? What's your evidence? You know, do you need that more evidence that, that there's something wrong with us? Like that there's something forgotten or something forfeited or something forsaken or something. Do you want to add something? Oh, just, I don't know. I, I was going to sort of, well, this is what Rafi just said made me think about, well, about this idea of we, we don't see ourselves. I mean, don't we see ourselves too much in a way? Like Rafi's point isn't that we, you know, people see we're the only persons, the only yeah. human person, like the only person. I think that's about, and now, I mean, the word that comes to mind when I hear yeah. is ego. Like, yeah. and, I'm not, and I don't mean like the good kind, I mean that other kind yeah. that is like. We're self centered, we're ego centered. Ego you know, and maybe that's what we're putting in that, 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 that hole, that, that, that belonging void as well, is that we just obsess on something. And I don't mean to make all these judgments about us. I just, but I am. But with, with Native Americans or, or Native peoples that were limited by their environment, the tribes were limited by their environment. And in our society, we put that on its head. If we keep changing the environment so that there can be more people, so we can have an agricultural revolution, an industrial revolution, and a green revolution. And every time we have one, the population becomes another hockey stick. Yeah. And so we're, we, we are controlling our environment. And I think that a lot of the, the native mythology those tribes were controlled by their environment, so that when there was a lack of food, yeah. people didn't have it. So we'll go out into the lab and create a new strain.
maintain the rights so that we can have 50 million more people. And, and maybe that's where the ego piece comes in, is that we're, we think we're in control. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of complex narratives and complicated, like, stuff going on there. You know, about, well, just the fact that you are aware of it, that you are aware of that, which they would not have been aware of. That, right. that you, can, you can compare our historical trajectory to our ancestors or our, throughout history, you know, the historical narratives. Whereas theirs would have been, I don't know, I, I would have been, they would have been much more place-based. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have anything else? To, to, I, I really appreciate like the pushback too, like because I want to get challenged on this stuff. Um, there is a there, there is a reason for all this, but so yeah, I just wanted to explore a little bit about the narrative that's that's embedded within this, especially the one about science and scientists science having uh, relinquished its capacity to see. The humanities, you know, there is an effort, there are efforts to, to, to bridge those two things, a lot of them right now, but th I think there it is on, in dis on display. Um, so <clears throat> before we move on, I just thought I'd introduce this idea of ontological continuity, like the philosophers will know what that means, will know what that means. Ontological means like reality, it means our ontology or our ontos is reality. Right, philosophers. And continuity means that there is, you know, that it's a continuous thing. It's not discrete. This is from a, a uh, an astrophysicist uh, works at Harvard. He was instrumental in my PhD work. He came up with so if we are to articulate a unified worldview for all complex systems observed throughout nature, then we must objectively and consistently model each of them identically. To restate once more for clarifying emphasis, complex systems likely differ fundamentally not in kind, but only in degree. That is, degree of complexity manifesting ontological continuity. So that's kind of a, what does that mean? Like, sort of a sophisticated philosophical way of saying something. But that's what I'd like to explore a little bit uh, in the next sort of part here, uh, which is the response to the Anthropocene. And just to remind us, the question, uh, the response question is based on this, this question, if the Anthropocene is a planetary response to humans, what is a humane response to the Anthropocene? And what role can narrative play in it? I really want to stay focused on narrative. So I figured when I came in here that, every, that this was narrative studies group, that people would really have an understanding of what narrative is, and that I wouldn't be able to add anything new. So I wanted to make a point to make sure and offer you something in this talk that you didn't already know. I wanted to make sure I gave you something new. So, so what I'd like to do then now is to, is, to, is to ask the question, how can we bring narrative to bear on this, on formulating this response? In other words, I'm asking, what new story can we tell that can generate ontological continuity. Which would, <coughs> which would kind of equip us to see ourselves as part of that ontos, as part of that continuity. The thing that's missing when I do that exercise, that we don't notice ourselves. What narrative can we tell? And specifically, what natural narrative? You know, what, 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 what natural history can we tell? And so, <clears throat> that's what I'm gonna do next. It starts with a bang, the Big Bang. Actually, it starts before the Big Bang, in the mystery that physics doesn't have access to. This is sort of science's dirty little secret. Like we can we can parse out what we know, right, through a, through through um, like Newtonian physics and, and and relativistic physics and quantum physics until we get down to what's called the Planck time, or the Planck length, which is 10 to the negative 43 seconds um, after the Big Bang. We don't know anything that happened prior to 10 to the negative 43 seconds, which is an extremely small amount of time. My point is just that there's a mystery at the, at the, at the, at the, at the base of it. Would you agree? Or not? 
No? Yeah. Okay. I thought you might have insight into what's going on down there. There's a lot of philosophical conversation. There is, but they're all philosophical because math, essentially, breaks down at those small, small scales. How small? Well, a Planck time is the amount of time in seconds it takes for a photon traveling at the speed of light in a vacuum to cross one Planck length, which is 10 to the negative 38 meters, which is incredibly small. Anyway, the point is, there's mystery down there, so let's just acknowledge it and move on. But the thing about mystery is we don't know what it is. So for all we know, it's still, it's still going on. Like, we're still in the mystery. This is a scientific narrative. So 380,000 years have passed since the Big Bang, and, and, and we see this. We see this. I'll show you what this is, actually. This is a image of the sky taken with a satellite uh, called the Planck satellite. And this is what it looks like. We sent it up into orbit. It sees in the microwave. So it doesn't see visible light, doesn't see infrared, it sees in the microwave. We've sent it up into orbit, it spins around, and as it spins, I'll just fast forward here, you'll see, as it spins, it's seeing the, it's seeing the whole universe in, in, for, uh, in microwave light. And it's taking this image. And this is, as it, as it goes around, it compiles a, uh, a 360 degree view of the sky, and it creates this map of the early universe. What this is, is the residual energy of the Big Bang at the moment that it cooled enough to go transparent. So prior to this, prior to 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was so hot and so dense that it was just a white, hot plasma. So we've taken that image, and then we, we, we cancel out the galaxy, which is in the middle. That's the picture of the galaxy. And we end up, after we've processed it, this is the first iteration of it, but later iterations go more and more detail, and we end up with this. That's how we got that image. So this is it. This would be 360. If you look, if you could look out and you could tune your eyes to the microwave and you looked out there at the night sky, you'd see it up there in the sky. You'd see this pattern if you could see in microwave light. What these what these red colors represent are the temperatures of each point in space when the universe was much smaller than it is now, much hotter. But you can see it's not uniform. If, if, if this oval was more like this, it was really uniform in color, like this section right here, then nothing would have ever happened. Because, because there's a difference in temperature, okay, represented by the orange, the red, and the blue, right? It's only because of those differences that anything can happen. In other words, if it were all uniform, there'd be no relationships. There'd be no space for relationships to happen because there'd be no difference between this point and this point. They'd essentially be so uniform that they're the same thing. But what we see is that there's an ecology here. Like This is the primordial ecology of life of the universe. But what's really interesting about this is that so this is 380,000 years after, after the Big Bang. And, and here's, here's, the, here's the satellite looking back through space. It sees this surface. Behind that surface is the Big Bang. This is the plasma of the Big Bang. And then once it cools enough, it goes dark. They call that the dark ages. And then these stars, so we're looking back at time here. So let me see if I can show you what this looks like. Boy, I've lost a lot of slides. Um, so what we're really seeing here is the story of the universe recorded in light. So the first star, the first starry night happened around 400 million years after the Big Bang. So if you could have been there observing and you watched that pattern happen, it would appear, it would cool, then it would suddenly go black. It'd be 400 million years of darkness, of black, nothing in the universe. And then suddenly the first stars would have emerged. The first stars as hydrogen slowly became, came back together. So the first starry night records the pattern of the cosmic background radiation. 
so we look out tonight and we see, you know, we see these patterns of stars and we imagine, you know, the Greeks and all those different constellations. Those have changed over the, over the 13 billion years of the universe. The first starry night was directly related to the pattern in the cosmic background radiation. You with me? There's a continuity, and that's what I'm trying to say. There's a continuity between the Big Bang and the quantum fluctuations, which were random and like inexplicable, and how those were the blueprint for the, for the cosmic background radiation, which became the blueprint for the first starry night, which became the blueprint for the starry night tonight, okay? Including our star that we call the sun. Our, st our star, the sun, is one of these, okay? That emerged from the original blueprint. The earth also is part of that system, right? So all I'm trying to say here is that there's a story there's a narrative that, of nature going on here, of which is continuous right back to the Big Bang. The, the patterns that we see in the night sky tonight have a lineage that goes all the way back. There's a continuity, there's a narrative, purely scientific, acknowledging the mystery, but purely scientific, we have a story that goes all the way back to the Big Bang, and our solar system is part of it. So, in the background, there was this mega scale structure of the universe. It looked like this. But now I'm supposed to say, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. That's the wrong slide. That's the brain scan of a rat. <laughs> That's actually the mega scale structure of the universe or an artist wrote to me. It looks a lot like it, right? So, there are these symmetries in the mega scale structure of the universe. Here's the. Here's the, the the dark ages, the first stars emerge in the night sky, so that's the first starry night. Those stars will then organize themselves into <coughs> self-organizing principles, an ecology of stars into galaxies. Some of those stars, some of those characters in that story are so big that they go supernova. In the remnants of those supernovas, we get planetary systems like ours that have stars at the middle. And so here we kind of see an artist's rendition of how the early Earth formed. And it was a it was like a fiery place, bombarded with asteroids that were coming in and spinning around in this accretionary disk, an ecology of rocks, basically. And then, on that surface, on this surface, which, if you, if you could be here 4.5 billion years ago, Earth would look like that. There'd be no life, right? But today, it's covered with life. Some, something happened. Like somehow life happened on this planet. It's, it's bristling with life. So life happened. There's a bunch of different theories on how that may have happened. It may have come from somewhere else. It's, called, it's a theory called panspermia. But that doesn't really actually answer where life came from. It just says it came from somewhere else. So then we have like Darwin's theory of a warm pool, which was nice. That's not a warm pool. That's like a cyanide acidic lake. But. Or the latest theory, which are plausible, are these deep ocean vent theories about how uh, rocks, mineral structures, which are basically crystal lattices and organic molecules that were purely just by chance formed, they got into their own ecology and life happened. And so this is uh, a Cambrian, you know, sea scene. Obviously it's, you know, artistic or whatever, but these are creatures called trilobites, so life's gotten going on the planet, and it's already started to diversify. And here's the ecology again. Same ecology. It started as an ecology of light or energy. It became an ecology of stars. It turned into an ecology of rocks and planets and asteroids. And now it's an ecology of trilobites and crinoids. Okay, so this is Cambrian Sea on the early Earth. And then a cool thing happened. But does anyone see narrative here? Like, I see ecology. I see chemistry. I see... I see life, but I don't see narrative yet. Like, I don't think these trilobites are telling stories. Or thinking narratively, I don't know, but I, I don't think so. But they do something really cool. They start to change. They start to respond to their, to their living conditions, to the environment. And over time, they get more and more complex. And you might say more and more beautiful, I don't know. But they end up, you know, really taking off with this Thing, this diversity. But then uh, on the other side of the planet, there are some volcanic eruptions in 
in, in what, we, what is today Russia, the atmosphere changes to such a degree, the climate changes that they're gone. They go extinct. But that extinction opens up a new opportunity for more complex creatures. So I'm skipping a lot of the parts here because it's a 13.8 billion year story and I've got to tell it in like 10 minutes. But, and, and, and there's something new going on here. I can see lightning in the background. There's like a brain going on there, little reptilian brains and avian brains. And if we had a really clear picture, maybe we could see little mammalian brains down here in the bushes, little shrew-like things. I don't know if dinosaurs were doing narrative. I like to kind of fantasize about it, but I don't know. But then, remember all those rocks that were flying around 4.6 billion years ago? One of them goes out beyond the, you know, the, the orbit of Pluto, comes back around in this long, circuitous orbit, and ends up coming back in and returning, hits the planet 65 million years ago, dinosaurs are extinct. Nothing bigger than a chicken walked away from that, that impact. But these tiny little shrews, these little mammalian shrews that had the more complex brain, they, they did. And I like to imagine, you know, eventually hominids, early humans, emerged or evolved from those shrews through a lot of different steps. But I like the scene because there's a volcano in the background. And you can imagine these big chunks of obsidian, like glass or rocks, or even basalt, raining down onto this... Uh, this landscape, <coughs> and then this, I should probably be an Australopithecine afarensis, so that would be Lucy, I'm imagining. And she picks up one of these rocks. One of these brainy pri primates picks up one of these rocks, and, you know, this somehow imagines that this thing could be, could be useful, maybe, to crush something, a nut, or something like that. And we could actually modify it so that if it had an edge, it would be more useful. That, I think, is the emergence of narrative in the universe. I mean, I, I could be wrong, of course, but I'm just saying, like, I like to think that's the emergence of narrative. That story has now emerged in the universe for the first time. So that was two and, two and a half million years ago. Homo habilis means handy, handy man. Uh, and then that. I'm curious, did anyone feel the difference between that and that? Did you feel that? So, if that was the emergence of story, maybe this is the emergence of aesthetic. Because these don't have to be this beautiful to be functional. In fact, they're less functional when they have a blade. When they're this symmetrical, they're less functional. So maybe that's the emergence of aesthetic in the universe. And it only took a million years for humans to figure that out. So this is a million years later, Homo erectus. Now this one is really cool. This is a Mousterian hand tool. And it's, it's, what's cool about this is that, here, I think I have another one here. What, they don't want the little chips. What they want is to create a, a specific tool, like a specific edge. So what they do is they take a big rock and they hit it and hit it and hit it until these chips flake off. And what they're doing is they're creating a surface on the big rock. And then with the final blow, they hit it and they get the piece they want. So in other words, they're seeing one thing in terms of another thing. Does anyone know what that's the definition of? To see one thing in terms of another? Metaphor. So like that could be the emergence of metaphor. So, so what happened was about six million years ago, all these hominids were basically living in Africa, somewhere in Africa. Our lineage, for whatever reason, probably climactic or something, left the, 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 the arboreal forests. What would later become the chimps stayed. They didn't leave. But we did. Our species, our, our lineage left. And when they left, they had to cross every habitat that the planet has to offer. So they had to cross the jungle, the river, the bay, the desert, the glaciers, everything. Tim, is up? So, so what happens when a species, okay, armed with story, when story and aesthetic and metaphor go out across the world and encounter this, they create this. So this is like the first art, the first real art that expresses who we are. 
like our experience of crossing and, and the diaspora out of Africa, all of that cum accumulates into this expression of who we are through our art. And our first art is of these things that we encounter. So if we encounter caribou, we create stuff like that, which is exquisite. And whatever, whatever animal carved that, whatever human carved that, had to know about its internal anatomy, because it was probably butchering and eating. It lived intimately. It had that indigenous sort of sensibility. I guess what I'm saying is, here's a narrative, right, that can bring us to Shakespeare in the cave. So this is the narrative I'm talking about. This is the big history narrative that could, that's what ontological uh, continuity is, 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 is saying, is that our reality, even the stuff that is so, we seem so ephemeral and human and, he, and that, that we, that our imaginations and our expressions of our artistic creativity is part of that natural, because remember this story started in the physics of the Big Bang, right? And it worked through chemistry and geology and all these things that aren't human. And now it's like in the most hum human part of who we are. Did I turn something off? No, no, you turned it off. Okay, thanks. So, <clears throat> I guess what the, the, the one I wanted to leave you with, and so I, I said I, would, I wanted to kind of give you something new, like maybe something that you had never sort of felt before, so I'm going to just show you this image. We all know that one? Right, Van Gogh's Starry Night. So you were talking about meta-narrative and paradigm. Like what, what does a paradigm shift really feel like? What does it mean? What does ontological continuity mean as a paradigm? So we've all, we all know the story. We all know the narrative of this painting. But here's a, here's a, here's a, new, here's a new interpretation from, from a paradigm of ontological continuity, the cosmic story. Van Gogh painted this with paint, yellow, probably from cadmium, which was forged in those stars. That whole stars create elements, like cadmium. And, and there it is, expressed in a star. So, so this idea that, that the materials of stars can, can end up in stars, the paintings, the artistic expression. And the white, too, titanium white. Okay, but let's, let's go further. Let's get more radical. So when Van Gogh painted this, he had to take the brush, dip it in the paint, and put it up on the canvas and move it around and do all this. You can see his movements in there. Well, how does he do that? How does he... How does he move? He uses his muscles, and his muscles are, and I forgot to tell you about this, but his muscles are using electrical signals, electrical impulses, that are the electromagnetic force. One of the slides I lost was a diagram of the fundamental forces of the universe, which emerged right after the Big Bang. And one of those is the electromagnetic force. Van Gogh's using that force to paint Starry Night with materials that were forged in stars, okay? He didn't even know that. He didn't know it because he was, the story goes, he was crazy. He was in an asylum when he painted this. And the story goes that there was no windows. So he painted this scene from memory. Van Gogh's memory, think about that. Vincent Van Gogh's memory, what is that? Well, it's the electromagnetic force embodied in neural networks in a biological being that evolved on a planet to spread paint around on canvases that was forged in stars. I mean, okay, so my point is, I don't, I've never heard that interpretation. It go to all the art museums in the world, no one has ever said, that's what the starry night could signify. Do you know what I mean? Because any interpretation I've heard has been, hasn't had an ontological continuity with the universe. That's what I'm saying. That's the radical idea that I'm hoping to, that you hadn't already heard. <laughs> and I get, I get the sense you probably hadn't, because I made it up. <laughs> oh, there's the, there's the diagram of the strong nuclear force. And so these are probably, I'll probably find my slides now. So that's, that's, that's it. Um, that is kind of a, a, an amalgamation of a narrative, cosmic evolution, natural history, the Anthropos. What, what I'm presenting here is the raw materials for that new meta-narrative that could be 
part of a humane response to the Anthropocene. Have I made that connection between like how our current conception of who we are is divorced from who we really are? We don't really carry around this whole family history that's shared among all of us, no matter what race or continent or, or economic class we come from, we all, this, is our, this is our family story. You know, this is, this is where kinship can be, can be found in this story. And, and, and through that sense of kinship with the world, we can gain that sense of belonging and potentially reauthor new narratives that are better than the Anthropocene. That's my point. And um, today, this has manifested in this, this company that I started. It's not a company. It's more like a, I don't know, project called Oika. Uh, and we use a lot of these concepts to um, inspire artists to experience nature in a new way, in this kind of cosmic, natural narrative way, and then bring that, what I'm calling ecological intelligence, to their work as a way of reshaping culture in the Anthropocene, as a response to the Anthropocene. So yeah, I, I mean, I didn't mean to get into lecture mode there, but uh, I, I kind of wanted to keep it as a conversation, so if there's any questions or uh, pushback on any of that, I know it's getting hot in here. And, and I think we have uh, an I like that idea a lot. I think though that, I, what I hear also a lot is that it, it, it's almost coming as, 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 as um, an afterthought, whereas what we need, so, so I like that idea a lot, it makes a lot of sense, but it's because I, it, it, the, the, the logic it, uh, dovetails with my worldview, right? Whereas, the worldview of all of it, collectively, isn't really ready for that. Do you see what I mean? Like, what that idea is makes a lot of sense to me, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to most people, because we're we're, we're almost trying to fix a symptom as opposed to. Am I am I making sense? Like, what I'm saying is, I hear a lot of ideas about how to fix the Anthropocene that don't focus on our base narratives, on our core understanding of who we are. And if we can get that right, then that solution makes a lot more sense. In fact, it would be the natural thing to do. It wouldn't be a radical idea that needs to be educated about. It would just make sense. It would, and so it would happen it would happen de by default, in a way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking like the conversations that I hear aren't happening at a deep enough level, at the at level of narrative, psychology, and identity, and all that deep consciousness stuff, in order for that to actually get implemented at the, at the scale and depth that it needs to be implemented. Does that make sense? So I I'm always hearing that, like, like the radar is on high. But how do you know things are going to happen linearly? And you know, when you, I'm thinking about your rock, that all of a sudden is you know in a few pieces, and we're using it as some kind of tool, and then all of a sudden there's that metaphor where that rock is now sliced. And I'm thinking, gee, that person had imagination. Metaphor is imagination. And so if we're all using our imaginations, which we have, we can actually have some breakthrough um, actions that <clears throat> when we look. And in, in 10 million years, we look back, we'll say, oh, that's ontolo ontolo ontological I continuity. Know, yeah. Continuity. But in fact, it was a breakthrough because of some imagination that somebody had. Right. Something emerged. So, so what Todd is saying is that, you know, we've got these ideas involving the way we think, but there are people out there who had to imagine that possibility before it actually started to take place. 
And that's where I see the promise in what we do at Endocosology is we work with our students and we all start imagining solutions to this you know, terrible problem that we have. And some of those will evolve in this from, through continuity, I guess. That process that you're describing is the creative capacity of the cosmos. When, when, when you do that, when you consider a new idea or create art, you're literally extending this story. That, that, that's, that's profound. Like, and I don't think we participate in this as if that was the reality. But that is the reality. That's the reality that all this science is showing us, is that reality. When you're in art therapy, right? Yeah. Do you feel that? <clears throat> Like, I get that too, but I'm, I'm gonna push back and say, that's not enough. Like, it's not about using natural materials to, like, that's not what Oika, which is this thing that I started, is about. It's actually about, I, I, it's, it happens deeper than that, because, and that might be very therapeutic, and I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna diminish that in any way. I'm just saying that uh, this emergent, moment, this emergent possibility that happens, is going to happen outside of that, that linear thing that, I, that I'm hearing, that I hear a lot, let's say. I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, to, to say that I'm only going to use natural objects, what does that mean? I'm, going to, I'm not going to use this plastic? Well, this plastic is, is, is produced with petrochemicals that you know, are extinct plants that lived in the uh, Devonian, or the, you know, the Carboniferous. So this is natural. So to say that I'm only gonna use natural materials is a presumption that I'm not natural or that this is natural and that's not natural. There is no natural world, there's just the world. And that narrative of the natural world, the human world, can, can somehow, if you're not careful, get perpetuated. I see it a lot. Um, not, I'm not saying I see it in your program, I'm just saying it's, it's a deeper conversation. Because otherwise, it's, it's not going to have tra the kind of traction we need. Yeah. Who's to say we have to move fast? I mean, what's the time frame? When you say the traction we need, but then maybe we are in the traction we need. I'm just pushing back. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, that's good. Uh, I think it's urgent, but it always has been in a way, you know, so. It was urgent a right. million years ago. Right. And not only that, I mean, who, you know, who knows what could happen. Another asteroid could come back and make all of our efforts to replant the rainforests irrelevant. So, uh, but, but <coughs> that takes imagination. And unless we're having that conversation, which is a whole new conversation than it has been historically, then you know, we're, this is the process. Uh, it's, it's a hard conversation to have. Uh, but it's fun, and it can be exciting if it's, if it's done with an open sort of mind and heart. I think we're, I think we're out of time. We can let the students go, and some yeah. of us will continue the conversation. Thank you very much for your time and testimony. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about the slide mix-up. I don't know what I'm I need to run up, but I wanted to ask a question.